we're happy to happy to help them out. Yeah, amazing. So thank you so much for coming. Um, the background, I think you guys all know the background to this. So this is basically our Agile book club here. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, we finished reading a book, had a discussion about it. Um, and so, yeah, I guess we just wanted to have a chat um, quite informally. Um, I guess I could I could kick off by just asking quite generically. Um, well, actually, we'll, if we can, we'll start by asking you all a question. Oh, yeah. So yeah, raise, yeah. Ra raise your hand if you've actually folded a piece of paper in half and recorded a conversation and scored it using any of the techniques in the book. Anyone? We're doing ah, one. I see one hand. That's excellent. I saw, one, I saw one hand. OK. For everyone else. <laughs> we have a session on Friday um, to okay. really do that in a small group. Yeah. And, and one thing that we can tell you about, which you may or may not know, is that uh, we did a webinar, and then we created a, um, a downloadable kind of run book, a kind of guide to how to run one of those sessions. Um, and we call it a conversational dojo. Uh, have you seen that at all? Some of you are nodding. Fantastic. David has. David has. Great. So you might just grab that and use that as a guide to your Friday session if you want to, because what we tried to do is make it. We noticed that lots of people were not folding paper in half and, and doing the exercise. So you're not alone. Those of you who didn't do it, don't worry. But um, the benefits are huge if you actually do that. So uh, we wanted to make it as easy as possible to do that. And we have lots of suggestions for how you could. So our strong suggestion is grab a hold of that. If you have any trouble getting it, ask us. We'll help you and um, try some of the things in there. Mm, amazing. I, I have a copy of that. I can circulate to every, everybody. So uh, yeah. Fantastic. Circulate far and wide. Yeah. That's why we, that's why we re rewrote it so that people could get the most out of the book. You want to say anything about that, David? Well, actually, to, to be honest, I was trying to write some questions for today, but then I was really thinking about, I got into a hole about thinking about whether my questions were genuine or whether I was being <laughs> transparent. Or Don't like, worry, we, we won't judge you. You're yeah, welcome yeah, to yeah, ask yeah. non-genuine questions. We might yeah, quote yeah. you, but but you're yeah, welcome yeah. to ask non-genuine questions. We won't be uh, We won't be offended. So, you know, after read, reading the book and, and thinking about the stuff in the book and, and, and things like that, it, is, the, is the practice just as, just as it's like how you're going to bring, because when you read the book, there's a lot of things there about changing the way that you kind of, not changing the way you speak, but change, changing the way you approach conversa conversations. Uh, yeah, it's obviously your in the your mindset, yeah. yeah. Well, how you are thinking is, is vital. Yeah. So the actually the practice is 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 really super key in that because it's like just reading the book won't really it will get you somewhere, mm -hmm. but it won't get you it won't get you a a sort of uh, sort of a, an improving path that, that you can keep on going on. That's why we like to ask the folding the paper question because we yeah. want to see how many folks have have got that extra benefit that that um, the real benefit of the book. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I'll just uh, just adding that because the the, the the issue is that we are our performance in conversations is invisible to us and this is this is this is the root problem if we could see what we were doing in our conversations we wouldn't do what we do we would do something else so it's a it's the it's a problem of lack of feedback you know i wouldn't have a consulting business because <laughs> it would be much easier people wouldn't have these we wouldn't have had to write the book so, so this challenge that our cognitive biases prevent us from seeing what we're actually doing they prevent us from observing our performance in any sort of objective way so it's, in this case, it's very different from other skills. You know, if you if you're skiing and you think you're a great skier, but you keep falling down, right? That gives you a certain sense of like, actually, maybe I'm not that good. If you're, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're trying to to create a pot and uh, and, the, and it doesn't hold water, you know, there, there's sort of objective feedback that you get from the world from many skills. Conversations are not like that. Our our our, our biases uh, prevent us from getting an accurate picture not i mean not entirely we see some things and we've adjusted our conversations uh, our strategies in our conversations are optimized for those things that we can see which is why we tend to do things like avoid conflict uh, because we can see that <laughs> we want to avoid making people upset because we can see that um, what we can't see is whether we're improving or worsening the relationships uh, what we can't see is whether we're um, contributing to group think uh, or, or unproductive cycles. So, yeah, what we're left with in the end is a bunch of 
you know, positive attributes for things we can see and a bunch of negative attributes that uh, are a result of what we can't see. And the, the practice in the book is learning to see. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're giving yourself uh, a new source of feedback. And once you have that feedback, then you can start changing your uh, behavior, which starts with changing your mindset. You know, you see different things, which leads you to think different thoughts, which leads you to say different words. So the, the ultimately, your conversations is the outcome of your mindset, and your mindset is a function of your experience, and you're giving yourself new experiences. Do, do you find that there's a, when you ask people, when you go into these sessions, you ask people, have you actually done that? What do, do you find that a lot of people are reading the book, but then not getting to that point? And do you think yeah. there's a, there, there's, what, what do you think is the barriers to, to get into the conversational uh, uh, analysis? I, I, was, I was just doing it yesterday. I was uh, working with a, a new client and I was uh, in a group and I kind of zeroed in on one person. Don't worry, I won't do this unless you ask me to because because the reaction was was terror. Um, but but I'll, I'll use Nicole because she's she's smiling. I'm not really doing this with Nicole, but but um, imagine if I were I, I, I went to this person in the group and I said, so you, you say that there are these other people in the business who uh, you don't trust. They bring you new things to do and they're, they're, you're not sure whether they're, they're of value. Not that any of you have ever heard any of this happen before. Um, so uh, to the person who was like Nicole, I said, so um, uh, uh, what, what, when uh, have you talked about that with the person? She said, no. And then I said, uh, so what would happen if you said to that person that you don't trust them? She said, I don't know. I'm not sure what would happen. Oh no! And Nicole is doing the right the right facial expression. So I made this poor person completely terrified. Um, and uh, but I I hope I was able by kind of overcoming that terror, helping her to to think about what that and role play a little bit what that would feel like, how that could really help their relationship and how they could change how they were interacting. Because for example, she might discover that the reason that person brings her ridiculous uh, requirements is because they're worried that she won't deliver. And so there's a lack of trust on that person's side. And if she could learn that, then that would help her to improve the relationship. But none of that is visible. And of course, it's terrifying to do it because you have that feeling of dread. Oh, my gosh, I would be I'd be creating conflict. One of the training courses Jeffrey and I do is called mining for conflict. Like, how could I find more conflict? How could I have more conflict in my organization? And, and sometimes people are quite worried about <laughs> increasing the amount of conflict when we tell them that that's what uh, the, what the title is. So that's my analysis. Jeffrey might have a different view, but uh, my, my uh, general impression is uh, uh, um, overwhelming terror. <laughs> and, and, and I'll add on sort of the, the sort of the, the lack of visibility means that people don't feel the the need, right? It's it's uh, um, it, these problems that we describe are invisible, and when you sort of you can say, well, objectively, yeah, it's sort of like I'd like to be stronger. Okay, well, so you're going to the gym and lifting weights. You know, uh, well, no, but I would like to be stronger. Okay, well, what, <laughs> what's the gap there between this sort of desire and ac action? Well, yep. it's it's not really that important, and it's really comfortable to s stick with the habits we have. There's a, a phrase that Chris Argers uses, which is skilled incompetence. You know, we our conversations may produce the outcomes that aren't what we want. In that case, we're incompetent, but we're really skilled at it. We do it effortlessly. And, uh, and so, so, you know, there we go. So it's, we can, we can instantly produce the wrong behavior, uh, it's so effortlessly it's, it's, it's invisible to us. And, um, the, the alternative, um, by contrast requires deliberate effort. And if everyone's read, uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, thinking fast and slow, and it talks about system one, your unconscious automatic system, right? Our, our traditional pa practiced conversational habits are all system one. They just happen effortlessly without thought. To go in practice requires involving system two. It requires doing effort and analysis. And we are literally evolved to, to avoid effort. So it's, it's the default choice is to, is to not go do the work. So that's the... So we, we weren't surprised, okay. but we were disappointed to learn that people were doing it. <laughs> go ahead. I, know I think so. that was a phrase he used about thinking on purpose. Yeah, I, I, I haven't used the piece of paper scenario, as you kind of mentioned, but I have written down conversations on like a just a notepad, just while well, thoughts on what I think might happen. Yeah. Um, and that has 
I mean, I think subconsciously I had been doing that a little bit before, maybe because I've not been here so long. So I was a bit nervous about maybe what what the outcome will be or what I need to get across. Um, but I find that that works really well if I plan in advance. So you're, so I think that's probably what you're getting at. So it's mm -hmm. about spending a lot of time on things before you kind of jump in. Where I probably struggle a bit more is when you get a conversation where someone's just uh, kind of thrown a curveball and then you you're not really you haven't done that kind of thinking so maybe it's kind of you try and you need to sort of slow things down and think about what the right outcome is before you kind of give a response but that person maybe wants a response quite quick that's where i mm. struggle a bit more but so, um, so i'll get i'll give you two techniques for that uh one is um kind of straight from the book is um you know, go and ha uh, do the conversation go ahead and give the quick response probably um in art fully and, and and not as well as you could and then do the analysis afterward with as much of it as you remember but you'll probably remember that curveball that's the moment when they said yeah but won't it be done on thursday and you're like, what thursday i thought it was next month oh wait oh uh, uh, you'll probably remember that bit and that's the bit you, you can analyze and then you can discover how you could do better the next time and you could even go back to the person and you could say you know that response i gave you i really didn't think that was very good and and i thought up something else could we talk a little bit more because I, I think i've thought about it a bit more and could we talk a bit more about it that often works um and then another even more powerful one is uh i had a client that i was uh coaching and uh, she found it very challenging. She was just a relatively pensive thinker. She wanted to think about things before responding. And so uh, we just evolved a, a, a pre-planned action for her, which worked great for her. You wouldn't think it would, but it was it was really powerful and, and um, useful. And she, she would say something like this. So I'm learning some new techniques for, for um, having conversations and improving, and I'm not great at them yet. And uh, that's a great question or a great idea, or you know, that's something I'm interested in, but I'm not ready to respond yet. So I'm gonna come back in 15 minutes and uh, I'll, I'll have a response for you. So just give me 15 minutes. You'd get up and walk out of the room. This is before the pandemic. So um, you, know, you could still get up and walk. She would walk around the block <laughs> and collect her thoughts, come up with something and she'd come back and she'd say, you know, I'm really curious about why you thought it was Thursday. Can you tell me how you got to that conclusion? Cause that doesn't match how I came up with that. Could, could you help me out with that? And that would be her better response than you jerk. How did, why did you think it was Thursday? Which was her first response. So um, uh, no, that's, that, that's perfect. more powerful and requires some some courage to say, I need 15 minutes. I don't know what, I'm, I'm not sure how to respond, but it worked amazingly well uh, for her. Thank you. That was, that was very good to hear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I ask you a bit about, um, you were talking about conflict resolution um i did a course on that um probably quite a traditional course quite a few years ago now i remember my key takeaway was um to kind of point out gently and diplomatically to the other person how they might be coming across um and i was wondering when you're talking about conflict mining does that um, contrast with kind of like traditional conflict management techniques because that that was the real thing I remember like I say it was years ago mm -hmm. um, but that I I was I was to kind of very diplomatically show the other person the effect that their behavior was having and kind of ask them if they understood that it was having that effect I have the feeling Jeffrey is going to say the words nonviolent communication in a second, but I don't know. Am I reading Jeffrey's mind correctly? <laughs> well, I, I was thinking about that. Um, I, I think the it's it, it it the um, so I was, I'll just say in general the conflict that we're talking about is slightly different. Um, the word conflict is is one of those overloaded terms, and um, usually people when they are think of conflict, the first that comes to mind is unproductive conflict between individuals. But what we're trying to promote is productive conflict between ideas. A and the problem is our fear of the first kind prevents us from having the second kind. We lose the value of the, of the clash of ideas because we're worried about how we'll be perceived, we're worried about offending people, we're worried we'll look silly. Um, so we don't get the diversity of thought that really should be the value of teams. Um, and and so we're we're mostly focused on trying to amp up, you know, that element, that that idea of um, having productive conflict between ideas, and helping to understand the difference between 
conflict between ideas and conflict between people right and and i think when so that's 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 our focus now that the, the traditional conflict resolution i would say what you're describing uh there's um if you were if you're kind of addressing that then I, I this is not something that really we discuss in the book because our discussion in the book is really about uh, about being um uh, around the sort of collaboration however i think if you look at the core technique around transparency and curiosity then there it is connected to what you're saying about being transparent about the effect of their behavior has when you do x i feel y mm -hmm. now there's a difference here uh, well there's, a, there's an important element here which is around where you assign you know is is, is there blame or or ownership so if I said, you know, when you uh, interrupt me, it, it makes me angry is very different than when you talk while I'm, while I'm already speaking, uh, uh, I feel um, sad uh, because it makes me feel like you don't value what I'm saying. Like these are, these are miles apart <laughs> in, in a sense, though they're describing the same incident and the same sense of emotions uh, uh, internally. And the, the difference is where, when I speak, where I put the focus. And fundamentally, I speak about my experiences of which I am the expert, <laughs> right? Um, uh, interrupting is like this type of blame. You know, when you interrupt me, you know, you're, you're showing disrespect, right? That's, I'm, 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 I'm um, trying to be a mind reader of their intent, right? And it doesn't say, even if I say, if that feels really disrespectful, that's still the same. I'm saying you're, you're, you're being disrespectful. <laughs> but if I said, you know, I, I, I feel, I, 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 I know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that you're not valuing my contribution or I, I'm frustrated because I had more to say and I, I don't, I, I feel inhibited to keep talking because you're speaking. Uh, I don't know what to do. I mean, so when I talk about myself, I'm being transparent. Uh, 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 and, and so I think that's that's how uh, th that where there's some adjacency between traditional conflict resolution, uh, it, and I think good traditional conflict resolution will tend to talk about this sort of I language, the effect on myself, my own emotions. And as uh, Squirrel mentioned, there's the whole uh, world of nonviolent communication, which um, is it kind of laid out that way, where you would talk about here's the observable thing, here's the feeling that I have because of my need and then therefore I have my request. Um, so that would say something like when you speak while I'm speaking, yeah, there you go. Uh, 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 I feel sad because I have something I want to share with the group and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, and I feel that uh, they're not going to be able to get the value of what I'm saying. So my request would be, would you be willing to wait until I'm done speaking before you talk? Like that would, that, that would, you know, be a standard NVC response that I think is consistent with what you were describing as the um, conflict resolution. And, and I'll add something slightly different, which which I don't think is in conflict, but it certainly has a different um, angle, which is uh, you use the word diplomatic. So diplomatically point out to them what what's uh, what the effect is. And I don't tend to be a big fan of diplomacy. Um, now, in cases where diplomacy applies, like when people are pointing guns at each other, it'd probably be good to be diplomatic and help them to not shoot each other. That's good. But we, I hope we don't have any guns at Smart Pensions. That does, that's not the not the issue. So um, what I'd encourage is is avoiding something we don't talk about in the book. It's a very useful Argyrus concept uh, called easing in. And easing in might sound like this. You know, I just thought you might like to hear that there's a small issue and it's just something I wouldn't worry about it too much, but you know, it's just sometimes you have a tendency to speak at the same time, you know, the other person hasn't quite finished yet and that just causes a little bit of concern. And is that something that you could uh, possibly consider changing a little bit? That would be super diplomatic and really hidden, right? So you're really avoiding the, um, the issue. Whereas the kinds of things that Jeffrey was, just, was describing are more threatening, they're more concerning. They aren't terribly diplomatic, but they are constructive. So unconstructive would be, you jerk, stop interrupting me, right? That's unlikely to produce a good response or, or um, productive conflict. Whereas you might have a productive conflict after you said something uh, like what Jeffrey was modeling, when you interrupt me, 
I feel sad and unimportant. Is there something that we could do about that? The person might say, I don't want you to feel sad and unimportant. You are unimportant. You know, I can't believe that I'm sitting here talking to you and that might lead to more conflict and more difficulty. Um, but it would be productive. It would be useful. You'd be learning something about um, where your conflict is coming from, but it wouldn't feel very diplomatic. So I, I kind of seized on that word and I'd encourage um, less diplomacy and more um, uh, uh, blunt construct constructivity. How's that for an invented phrase? Can I, can I just touch on, touch on the related word to dip, uh, diplomatic, which is um, political? Mm. Um, so political speech is uh, when you choose your words um, to try to control how the other person reacts, right? So you're choosing your words based on the, uh, uh, to, get, to get a certain response from the people, as opposed to say communicating, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, and it, since there's a kind of a, 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 a kinship here between the diplomatic speech and the political speech, people say, oh, political speech is bad, but they don't really under always understand what it is. Um, and, and, and really the heart of political speech is about trying to control other people. What we advocate is about um, abandoning the idea of controlling other people and instead focus on speaking the things that you know and uh, and listening to what other people know which is which is a, a very just fundamentally different approach that leads that's to a lot of learning but learning is painful yeah. we can talk a lot more about that go ahead that's what i really uh, that's what i really liked about the book and i'm obviously reading the nonviolent communication book as well is because a lot of my speech before has been very quite political and uh, the the way that I, I I sort of and also I think there's a bit of a thing in, in agile you, you know the whole idea of the kind of like powerful question or the or or, or that kind of thing it is kind of can be sort of like you're actually just constructing something to make people you know to get your view across or to people to make people see the right way and uh, yeah. And, and yeah you can get a little bit wrapped up in, in, that, in that kind of idea and that's what i really liked about this is, is to kind of strip that away and and you know it, for me because i've had a lifetime of, of talking in this particular way um it, it's quite challenging because it's like whoa it's like trying to rewire my brain and i, I feel like a little bit that i'm going to get stuck between like you know the the, the system one of the the fast system and the slow system and just be like kind of a bit mute <laughs> it's like well i want to say this that's not uncommon not. yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's actually why going back to david's question it's why that person i was coaching needed that 15 minutes because um eventually she was able not to need the 15 minutes and it became more natural it was easy to produce the uh the behavior she wanted in the moment but at first it's very difficult and that's why i'm not surprised that david when he gets a curveball might go uh, 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 i'm not sure and, and say something that's not so helpful and then need to go away and think about it and come back i can't remember the french phrase for it but it's um the, the, the response you think up on the stairs that it's yes, you think up the response, you know, like, oh, I should have said this. Yeah. Uh, and and you, you have that a lot as you're learning uh, new ways of interacting. So so don't feel bad. Uh, sorry, there's two Davids. Um, yeah, don't yeah, feel yeah. bad if you're in David R's situation. <laughs> sorry, David R's situation uh, where where you uh, are stuck or in David T's situation where you're you're kind of mute and you feel um, uh, that it's tough. That That's a signal that you're learning. That's a good thing. Which, which is why one reason we advocate practice so heavily because you want to try to have those moments uh, um, <laughs> in practice, you, you you can only produce what you've practiced. So, if you if you you can't, why would you expect to be fluent on something you have never practiced? That that, that would be unreasonable. Um, mm -hmm. What and then coming back, it's sort of um, the, the analogy we have, and so it goes back to my opening question on how people practice, is because otherwise it's sort of like you've read a book on how pianos work. Um, and then you would say, well, are you ready? You know, have you done any practicing of the piano? Well, no, but I really enjoyed the book. Like, okay, but <laughs> the, the reason that the piano exercises were there was so you learned to play. I mean, I'm glad that people find it interesting uh, and a, a good way to pass time. But if you want to develop the skill, it's going to require some, you know, making some notes. And some of them are going to be bad. And, <laughs> you know, that's uh, when do you want to do that? Do you want to do that on stage or? you know, in, in the practice room. There, there is a certain of vulnerability though, in terms of like the, doing the conversational practice, even just with a group of people that have read the book. We did the read the book 
and, and you know we suggested at the end sh shall we do this and um i don't know whether the other people yeah. here that were there might agree with it it was a little bit like okay um so so yeah the, obviously there's vulnerability there and obviously within a work environment you're, you're talking about conversations that you're having with other people within a work environment and uh um yeah uh, how, how do you find that that it, it's a sort of techniques you know i think i've been to one of your um uh, th uh tuesday or thursday sessions uh jeffrey uh and uh we, we kind of just really sort of it, it sort of seemed to be that we just really took a section of the uh, of, of the conversation is that how you deal with the uh, sort of uh, making it a little bit more anonymous for people it, it yes and, and uh, the the in the in the dojo practice sessions I usually describe two different well we describe three different times of dojo sessions but in a in a skills based practice we'll typically just focus on one little part. Uh, and and as you say, that allows people to be to to share. They don't need to share the whole context, um, and they can just be on this this segment related to the particular skill and practice that we're doing. In the in a different type, there there can be sessions where someone is like, I you know I'm coming up and I've have something and I'm going to be the focus of the whole session. Like the session is going to be about me and all of you helping me. <laughs> In which case, I'm going to share the whole conversation. And we'll look at, you know, we'll look at a lot more because we're not practicing a particular skill. We're trying to now apply all the skills across the whole conversation. So there's a slight difference in practice session based on intent. Are we focusing on a particular element or are we focusing on a particular person, a particular conversation? So that's kind of an, an option that you have. So, so like for us that we're going to be running our first session on, on Friday afternoon. Where, where yeah. do you think? Is start there with any skills sort of, based one? Yeah. Start with a skills based one. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it, keep it narrow. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say even yeah. just start with the. I mean, in the the recommendation in the kit is start with the foundational one of just transparency and curiosity. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then from there you can move on to the other. Um, uh, chapters, other other practices, but start but with, the, you, with. You don't have to move on very fast because you'll discover yes. an awful lot just from that one. Yeah, that's, that's right. And would I'm you say? If, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry no, Douglas. Go, go ahead, David. I was going to say, should we be doing it regularly? I mean, is it obviously practice? You practice a piano, uh, you know, every day if you if, if you can. So, so yeah, is it regularity is 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 the key? Is it if it works for you? That's what you want to improve. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that that's the uh, the the method that we found is in fact the way we got to writing the book and suggesting the dojos is by actually doing that ourselves for six or seven years. We, we did it for a very long time. Um, that particular group has, has uh, not met in a long time, but um, that's how Jeffrey and I really practiced and, and got to the stage where we could write the book um, by doing that every two weeks for a very long time. Uh, you and don't was, have to do that. Yeah. I was doing it weekly in, in, inside Tim as well. So it, yes. for me, it was... Uh, and Jeffrey then got the, the most practice. Uh, and then the monthly London Organizational Learning Meetup. So I would do probably uh, seven or so practice sessions a month. But, but I hasten to add that you don't have to do that. If you did just one, you would get benefit. So yeah. um, it, it's every, the sort of thing that helps. you should do if it works for you. If, if someone's, um, what, what's the old thing in, uh, defining who's in a meeting, if people are there as prisoners, they, they won't get anything and they won't be helpful. Yeah. Um, if they are there as enthusiast, enthusiastic people who are willing to learn, then you will get a lot out of, uh, out of the group. So practice with a group who is, um, in, 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 in interested and enthusiastic. Uh, to that end, I, I was going to suggest that we might hear from some of the folks who haven't said anything, not that you have to, but I just don't want you guys to be left out if you have questions or thoughts or, or for example, want to disagree with us. Yeah, conflict is bad. We, we don't want to have that. that. That would be really interesting if anybody had uh, a, a contrary point of view or a question. And you don't have to either, but I just wanted to make sure it was open for, for others. Or questions about anything from the book? Um, I, I don't want to talk over anyone, but I want to say it. I don't think you are. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, I had a question. So I was talking to, to one of my friends the other day, and he is reading a book called You're Not Listening, What You're Missing and Why It Matters by Kate Murphy. Mm -hmm. um, and he was talking to me a little bit about it. and. And one key concept from that that he was describing was that impulse that we constantly have 
um, to interrupt, like we were talking about earlier, right? Instead of actively listening, we hear what the other person's saying, and then we think about how we want to respond. And we're always in a conversation like this, you know, just trying to get our thing out. And then we kind of got it out and we're like, ah, you know, done my piece. Uh, thank God I got that out. And, and it's potentially not the most productive conversation. Um, and I haven't read this book. Uh, he was just recommending it to me. But he was saying one of the techniques in the book is to sit with that feeling and to not respond and to really fight that feeling. And then we had an interesting conversation about, is that most useful at work or in your personal life? And then everyone in the room said, oh, no, 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 at work, you've just got to get your point across. Don't do that. Absolutely no way. You've just got to go for it. You've got to, you've got to be, you know, a leader. You've got to be dominant. Yes, yeah. And I was like, okay, that's really interesting. Um, you know, because I think they had this sense that they were taking their own power away by, by exercising that kind of control that was maybe a personal development piece but wasn't helpful in a work contest where there's this, like, this it, there shouldn't be this dog eat dog um, type of mentality, but potentially maybe there is some of that still, even with these people that I was talking to who are, they, they work in agile environments, right? And they understand agile. And so it's not their field as it were, but you know, they're designers and devs basically. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I was wondering what you thought of well anything I just said really. Kate Murphy's yeah. book, that technique. That was great. <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey, do you want to take that one or should I? I'm open to either one. Uh, yeah, I was thinking either way. I'll I'll, I'll just I maybe mean, I'll, I'll start with this. The, the what's interesting here is the one of the things that we talk about will be about testing your understanding, right? I think. Um, you know, there's the, there's the seven habits of highly effective rule of seek first to understand, then to be understood. One of the advantages of that, it kind of says, well, I'm going to test my understanding before I say my bit, <laughs> right? So, because I want to be right about, I want to make sure I understand what I'm talking about before I talk. Um, and I think the, 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 there's a sort of hubris. I mean, what, what people are describing of, oh, you just got to get yourself out there. They're assuming that they're right. And that they're going to look smart as opposed to dumb, right? Um, you know, they're like they're they're discounting like some of the options when they're saying, "Oh, got to get yourself out there." So I, I mean, I, I, I think that's a very big topic about what they're describing. Like you'd think, like, well, that'd be a great conversation topic for a retrospective on that team. You know, hey, by the way, just you know, I read this book and I had this advice, but I feel if I did this on the team, I'd be losing out. That you'd all think less of me if I didn't just interject. Um, you know, what, what, what do you all think? Is that, does that sound right? Is that, is that the environment we have? Is that the environment we want? And that'd be, it's like rich material here. Uh, I, I will say comprehensively, I think they're, they're, um, I, I think they're, they're mistaken in their strategy. I don't know their conversations, their environment. Maybe, maybe there is right. Maybe it's right for what, who they want to be and where they want to go. But it, um, it sounds dubious to me. Um, I, I, I find that people generally get a lot of, uh, 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 accurate judgment by their peers on how they behave. And people who are more thoughtful uh, get more attention or listen to more. Now, there can be extremes. I, I've worked with someone who is a, a real introvert. And, you know, he, uh, but w one of the things we did is make that discussable in our, in our group. And his view is like, if, if I get, if you talk, if you talk over me twice, it means you don't care what I have to say and I won't speak again. Um, so part of that was learning to be like, to say, well, wait, 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 Steve was talking. Can we, you know, I'd like to hear what he has to say, you know, but by making it discussable, we could come up with strategies to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to be thoughtful and heard and not just be, you know, survival of the loudest. Mm. So it goes back to, I guess, what's the culture you want? Um, uh, I, I did think it was interesting, by the way, the, the question about, you know, is this more useful at, uh, in work or at home, uh, just because so many people have said, you know, these techniques help me so much in my personal life. Um, I often have that in people I coach will say, my, oh my God, this is, you know, I know I'm getting this coaching for my work, but this has been so amazing for outside of work as well. Yeah, uh, I get that uh, a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's potentially 
harder at work, like David was saying, that to be vulnerable in that way. And when people are thinking a lot about uh, being perceived in a way that will allow them to get promoted and seen as a leader, um, you know, all of that stuff. How would you say that, Nicole, I'm just curious, just practicing here, how would you say that using I language? Because what you described was was like third person. It was, you know, it was like, mm. oh, that's potentially hard at work. But, you, but it doesn't say anything about how you feel. Like, so this is an example of being non-transparent. Um, <laughs> Oh no, I'm terrified of this conversation that we're going to have on Friday. Um, yes. So it's it's me and the two Davids doing the, the first kind of piece of conversation analysis. And, mm -hmm. um, so the fir first thing to say is, is it, ter terror is normal. So, <laughs> so so don't worry about that. That's that's perfectly normal. It's the same terror as you might have, a similar kind of terror as you might have if you were going to, um, I don't know, I've never done this, but jump out of an airplane with a parachute, right? A terror would be a normal feeling to have as the wheels go up. Right. It's like, oh, my God, I'm going to jump out of this plane. This is terrifying. Doesn't mean that it's not valuable to do and you might not get tremendous benefit from what you're going to do. But it does require uh, acknowledging some terror. So so uh, that's the place I'll start. But but see if you could describe it to us in, in eye language, as Jeffrey suggested. But so you said that you, you have terror of the discussion on Friday. Is it similar if you were going to have a more, I, I didn't mean to pick on you before, by the way, you were just convenient and I knew your name, but it um, sounds like it's true that if you were to go to someone and say, I don't trust you and you know your requirements are uh, unrealistic and so on, that sounds like it would be terrifying for you. Is that accurate? Um, it's interesting, not in every context. Mm. I think the context where I am more practiced, but this, uh, this technique of kind of almost bringing your unconscious thoughts closer to what you're consciously saying and kind of closing that gap, that's, uh, yeah, that's what's, that's what's really scary because yep. I think I've probably been taught to do the opposite, actually. Mm -hmm. Most people are. What we were talking about earlier, to be diplomatic, mm -hmm. and to pray and disguise that perhaps I... I don't think that's the right way to go about something or it's had X, Y, Z effect on me. Mm -hmm. We've probably been taught that that's a, a weakness to say, I have this emotion about this at work. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm always coaching people on using emotional signals and how useful the emotional signal is. Communicate it helpfully. Pounding on the table red in the face, you're a jerk and incompetent. Not a good way to express anger, not going to help you. I'm really angry that we're late. I can't believe that um, this uh, project hasn't been completed and this story was built so poorly. I'm really angry about that. That's a very useful, powerful technique, not to be overused, but very powerful uh, to, to communicate your feeling about the issue and to um, get the message across in a constructive way. Yeah, and I would, I would never do that, right? And that, this is why it's- you, you haven't learned to do it yet. You could learn to do something else. That's true. Well, that's hopefully on Friday. <laughs> yeah. That's so why I, we wrote the book to help people well, do that. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, people always have options. And I always say, you know, it's it's you can explore the option. Maybe, maybe better to not do it. Mm -hmm. And there are certainly cases where it would be. There are certainly cases where there's low trust and um, a real threat and where the, that would be an, an unwise choice to make. And, and that's valid. Not, not objecting to that. It's just if you want the most learning, starting by withholding a bunch of information about how you actually feel about the situation and how it affects you is not a great way for the group to learn and make the best decision. And you, you kind of know that. But at the same time, you also want to avoid the conflict because you've been taught to do that. But, but and, and I think it's also just it's valid to say, you know, I choose to be comfortable over, uh, uh, you know, I, I, yes, these these techniques may help, and they may get better relationships and have and better outcomes. We may be more productive, but I'd rather be comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, I I prefer to be comfortable than effective, uh, and and that's that's a valid choice. Yeah, it's kind of counter to my whole job. I try not to do that. But, um... but you've just <laughs> described how you've learned to be diplomatic. Now I'm really beating you. Now I really am giving Nicole a hard time. <laughs> you've learned to be diplomatic and therefore you are skillfully incompetent, right? So your whole job is about getting the right decision and sharing all the information. And one thing you're really good at is being diplomatic so other people don't guess what's in your left-hand column. 
yeah, yeah, probably. It's interesting that you pointed out I wasn't using eye language. I hadn't even noticed um, that kind of projection. Other people could find that really hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. But that's the kind of thing you pick up because it, as you practice, this is why practice is so important as you hear other people doing it and doing it poorly and then mm -hmm. improving, then you think to yourself, okay, great. And here's this Nicole person. And she's saying that's just like that other time. And she's saying, yeah, the other people could be, oh, wait a minute, that's me, I'm doing it. But you're not aware of it. It's, you're not conscious of it until you've seen it often in others. And then you can do the self-reflection to find it in yourself and, and, and have the habit. And I'll, I'll, say, I'll go a bit, extend that into the impact of the practice sessions. The people who are improving the most in a given practice session, in, in a given uh, um, discussion, are the people critiquing, not the person who's doing their case. Um, and the reason is because uh, um, the people who are critiquing can see the problems, right? So they're they're learning to see, they're learning to spot the patterns. Um, uh, uh, now, what's nice is then they need to follow by them being the person producing, and suddenly they can't produce the behavior. So the, the, you, you learn different things. When, when you're the person who's trying to produce the behavior, you learn, oh, I'm not good at this. <laughs> uh, uh, and when you repeat, you, you get better. So that practice is, and that practice is essential. But the kind of that first step of learning to see, it's easier to spot it in other people than to spot it in yourself. So um, uh, uh, in fact, that's so much so that I just in invented this um, principle that am I uh, uh, leaving, a, you know, having done this practice sessions, I come in the next, you know, you do this on Friday, you come in on Monday, you'll be in a conversation going, oh, the person's making this mistake. They're making this mistake. They're making this mistake. That's hugely valuable because every time you spot someone that you think is making a particular mistake, assume you're making the same mistake at the same time. So if you think, ah, they're not using eye language, then you can immediately you know, say, well, I think this, I have this and, you know, talk in eye language. You think, oh, that question wasn't genuine. Let me ask a genuine question, um, and it's a pretty good rule of thumb because you, what you what you're doing is you're beginning to spot the patterns of communication that everyone has, including you. You just can't see it in yourself. <laughs> so but it's using... safe to assume that if it's happening in the conversation, you're probably contributing. Exactly, that's right. And and uh, Jeffrey's being modest. This is called the Frederick mirroring principle. We didn't manage <laughs> to get it into the book, but uh, he deserves all the credit for inventing and and I, I get I deserve the credit for naming it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you were talking about not trying to control other people, right? Yep. I think my fear, so if I imagine a particular scenario where I would have been particularly fearful to have that, like an eye conversation and be vulnerable, um, I think the problem would have been this this is me thinking back to like a while ago in a particular scenario um the reason i didn't feel like i could do it because i didn't think vulnerability or transparency would have the right result right because i felt like it would make me look i would make them because of who i felt they were i would make them mm -hmm. take advantage of me kind of and I think you started to say, and, and it would make me look weak. Is, is that right? Did I hear that? Um, I, th I think, I don't think it would make me look weak, but I think they would think it made me look weak. And mm -hmm. they therefore um, kind of, you know, pounce on that. And that that is my fear. So actually reading this book, that's the exact scenario that came to mind. So, so let me, can we just play that through? So what would, what would pounce, how would, what would pouncing it look like? How do, how does Nicole, someone... we're going to knock her completely off her chair. How does how do, how, how, how keeps does going out of out of frame? How, how does how does someone pounce on that? Um. And I'll just say here, my prediction is uh, that pouncing will produce exactly the same outcome that you had. This, this is I'm just I'll, I'll, I'll put my cards on the table because it turns out that you have agency in the same way you can't control the people. People can't control you. Uh, I'm going to guess that you you would that pouncing would produce no difference in outcome. That's I'm gonna, that's my prediction ahead of time. But I'm but maybe I'll be wrong. I'll be I'll be, I'd love to hear about it. So, so I'll I'll feed the line to Nicole. Gee, Nicole, I'm I'm really worried and and this is an area that I'm feeling just really scared about because I I think we really can't deliver on Friday. And I know you really like that and I'm afraid that we won't that, and we're going to disappoint you. And that makes me feel sad and concerned. 
What, what do you think about that? Now pounce on me. What would pouncing sound like? It has to. It has to get done. Um, there's, there's no, there's just no given that. It's just what we have to do. Um, I don't care what you have to do to make it happen. Got it. So when you say that you don't care what we have to do, that that makes me also feel um, fairly sad. And and the reason I'm feeling sad is that um, I really care about getting it done also, and I don't see an option. So I, I find myself in a bind. Um, so the, uh, getting it done on Friday isn't possible. And I'd sure like to find a solution. Is that something you'd like to do? Uh, <laughs> damn you. <laughs> this is what practice does, is it gives you the tools that allow you to respond in a way like that. And notice I didn't give ground at all. I didn't say, OK, fine, we'll do it on Friday. We'll all stay up all night or something like that. I said, boy, it makes me feel sad. And I'm concerned that, that um, you know we can't find a solution. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, to kind of illustrate that it is possible to have, uh, to be pounced on and um, make that part of your learning. Because I learned, for example, and I'm trying to validate it, this person doesn't care what I have to do. And I want to dig into that and find out, does this person not care about my team? If that's true, it would be good to make it discussable. Like, my team doesn't matter. For example, this person might say, yeah, well, I mean, the, the business will shut on Monday if we don't have this done on Friday. So it doesn't matter like how, how you feel about it. If right. I could get to that, that would be really useful information I could put out my CV, right? Because I, I know it can't be done on Friday. <laughs> so I'm going to be out of a job on Monday. I better start talking to some recruiters. And that would be useful information even if I didn't improve my relationship with this person. Um, it would be valid information. Mm. What, what I wanted to highlight was the people are usually made of the illusion of, you know, giving up the illusion of control that you can control other people. Mm -hmm. What you gain uh, when you give up the illusion of controlling other people is the illusion that they can control you. So what you gain is the sense of actually these people can't control me. I, I, they make their own decisions. I can't control them and they can't control me. Yeah. And I, to me, that's a good trade. I'm very happy to have that trade. Yeah, I, I guess that's the problem, right? I came out of those conversations feeling controlled because mm -hmm. I guess I was not, I didn't have any of these techniques. I still don't have any of them, but I uh, definitely didn't, I wasn't even aware of them then. <laughs> and I actually, I felt very lost in, in how to deal with it. Because the traditional paradigm is a win-lose paradigm. Right, right. Con control or be controlled. Right. Uh, two, two thoughts to that. One is um, uh, even when people are practicing transparency, uh, they often forget about being transparent, uh, which is to say, you can say, I, I want to come back to this, but by the way, I'm feeling very nervous in bringing it up. Uh, 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 just, 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 you know, that, that every time you have an emotion about it, you can mm -hmm. share that emotion also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, second thing, and this is, I'm going to, this is something kind of slightly different, but it's, um, a different, an alternative technique. Um, when, when you feel you're being accused, especially if you feel like you're being accused unfairly, Try this. Try saying, you know, you're right. I am, uh, and uh, and I, I didn't think about that. I was thinking I wanted the best. But now that you mentioned it, I can see I probably am. H how is that for you? Can you tell me about that? Called the disarming technique. Uh, and uh, 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 what happens is when you uh, uh, um, when you try to defend yourself, uh, it convinces people that are right in their accusation. And when you accept the accusation, it, that sort of immediately disproves it. You have to think about this. You have to find the, the, the key of it is find the truth in what they're saying. So, so you have to genuinely agree with it, which is very tough. This is, right. this is not an easy technique out of the, um, the accusation and turning it into a productive conversation. What this, is, this is an empathy technique where we're accepting the other person's worldview as opposed to staying locked in our own view, yeah. worldview. And now let's think about what we could do differently to, to change that, both perception and reality. And, yeah. and I'll just describe, because I have to run in a minute also, um, but I'll just give you one one pointer to, to, to give you a sense of what's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a guy called uh, Xavier Amador. Um, maybe Jeffrey could grab the link for me because he knows where I want to go, um, uh, who uses a technique called LEAP. And he uses it with people who really are certifiably insane, people who are schizophrenic, 
who believe that um, other people have lasers shooting out of their eyes and, and hitting them, and who, who believe that people are communicating by flushing the toilet in other parts of the building to, to communicate with the CIA who is coming to get them, that kind of belief. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, elements of his LEAP method, it's listen, empathize, agree, and partner. And one of the things you agree, you find something you can agree with the person about. I agree that um, hearing the toilet flush must make you feel really panicked. I would feel panicked as well. Boy, I understand what that would be like. Okay. But um, the, it is possible to get to the point where you can agree with someone who has these beliefs, who has this um, chemical imbalance in their brain that's causing them to do things, and get to an, a, a partnering action, which is, gee, it would, it would sure be helpful um, for you to feel safe. And one thing that you could do is take this medicine, which would help you to sleep. And it helps you to sleep as well as helping you with um, some of these difficulties that you're having. And um, it w I'm not sure if it's going to help you escape the CIA, but it certainly would help you sleep. And th that would help you to, to you know, be better rested. And, and that, you said, is one of your problems. We agree that rest is important for whatever situation, including getting away from the CIA. Would you like to take this medicine? I'm doing it poorly. He's much, much better at it. Um, but um, uh, he's fun to watch if you wanted to see how far you can take this. Uh, so you could deal with a, a true psychopath, which it, uh, you are unlikely to encounter at work. But, um, you know, anytime we get a chance to talk to a group like this and, and get wonderful questions like you had, um, that's always very helpful. Um, and, and the last thing is, um, as David's already discovered, you can get um, uh, downloads and other things from uh, conversationaltransformation.com where you can find more stuff from us and uh, consulting offerings and other things. So if you're interested in any of that, please go have a look. I'm going to run off. Thanks. Thank Take you. care. Thank you very Bye much. Now. Thanks. So I don't know. If, I don't know if people have time, but if uh, if people do have time, I'd love to hear any sort of aha moments from the from the conversation. Usually go through alphabetically, so I, I would look at this and say, I, I start at the at the end, uh, which is uh, Sergi Shantu. Serge, yeah. Um, Serge. I think it's a reminder to stay curious mm. um, and be yeah, in inquisitive rather than responding. And you, you always forget that when you're in the moment. Mm. And it's reminding yourself to put yourself in other person's shoes to understand them better. Yeah. Cool. Any ahas from you? Uh, definitely that piece about people can't take your power away and control you and they that you can not give ground even if they're being extremely difficult to deal with you can still kind of retain your your power as it were as in your, your agency is maybe a better word for it right yeah um because that's that's been my problem in the past where people are really aggressive mm. and I just like shrink like I do not know how to deal with this. Right. <laughs> you know? Um yeah, definitely that. Okay. Yes. Um, well, I, I haven't actually read the book, but mm -hmm. my aha moment was, I think I do need to read this book. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I echo what everyone else has said, actually, um, in relation to this. It, it brings me back to uh, Coaching Agile Teams by uh, Lisa Atkins, who talks a mm -hmm. lot about proactive listening and not just listening to respond, um, which is really effective. Um, and, and actually, uh, what you were just mentioning at the, at the end there, which was embracing the transparency and sometimes mm -hmm. the accusations um, and making uh, celebrating that transparency, actually, making the transparency more transparent. Because yeah. I can't say hand on my heart that I would have reacted any differently to Suad yeah. uh, had I been <laughs> in the same situation. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, so thank you very much. And thank you very much for today. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. I really enjoy the chance to talk to people about this. Uh, David Thomas? Yeah, yeah, I think that I think the same point as, as well. Like what Suad Su was saying, and uh, Nicole, and, and that vulnerability, and it's kind of like I don't know whether this is the right way to describe. It's kind of like ninja conversation instead of <laughs> instead of like just trying to meet might with might, right? Because like like I say, I I I I can be quite competitive in conversation and that going back to that political thing it's about like getting my way getting the win yeah and um you know it, it, it's sort of like you know that actually 
you don't have to meet might with might. When people are being aggressive towards you or the, 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 there's a sort of, uh, you know, that, that kind of situation where you're being told that something has to happen, you don't then have to, you know, meet might with might and you can deal with it in a, in a, in a transparent and an honest way that, that just comes to a better outcome, really. So, yeah. yeah. Great. And finally, David Rose. Um, well, there were quite a few things that I found like, particularly interesting, most of which you've already mentioned in terms of like Nicole's conversation um, and what David was just saying. But the, additionally to that, I would add the, uh, when you mentioned about that you can actually say what emotion you're feeling at the time, like that was kind of the way you said it seemed quite casual in the way you added it to conversation. Whereas I hadn't really thought of it like that. So, I, um, that can I could guess that could be quite quite useful quite powerful um and I quite like the idea that yeah just coming back to um really finding out why someone has the stance that they do you know just just asking a little bit more because I think sometimes we accept that they okay they've got a different opinion to a, to what I have and the, but we don't necessarily always just go that that bit further to find out why or, or at least make it clear that we would be interested in knowing why. If you know yeah. what I mean, even if they don't want to tell us, at least we've tried, you know, put that offering there, you know, to try and find out. So yeah, absolutely. And a, a really powerful question for me has been, um, oh, that's interesting. What have what have you seen that makes you think that? Again, this is this is a phrase that I've practiced uh, to have at hand. Uh, so if someone believes something surprising, I can come out with that you know, I know what I'm going to say. Oh, that's interesting. What, what have you seen that makes you makes you think that? Nice. Uh, yeah. uh, and like you said, it's it's uh, people very rarely object to the idea. I'd like to understand their view more. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I had no one say, "You don't need to know why I got to this position. You don't need to know what I've seen. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I've seen." Well, no, I'm not going to tell you. No, like no one's no one's gone ballistic on that. So it's it's been a very good question for me. Well, anyway, thank you for those aha moments. I really uh, appreciate uh, it's. I have a conversation to to to, to know what that people are finding it value uh, valuable, getting those uh, specific things. That was all, by the way, a form of eye language because you're all saying I found this uh, interesting, uh, which is part of what makes it valuable. All right. Anyway, thank you all for having us.